Hello and um, welcome to these um, these lectures. I'm um, sorry that I can't be there so I'm just pre-recording these but um, I suppose that's the best I can do at the moment. <laughs> well um, I'm going to be talking about um, really these, this lecture series is all built around the, the idea of us trying to learn how we would start to write an operating system from scratch um, and the aim isn't really specifically operating systems or specifically programming it's just really getting to understand the computer better um, which will help you when you you know when you're doing high level programming in whatever language if you can get a, a firmer grip on what's happening underneath what's happening inside the computer how much of the stuff is done by hardware and how much is done by software you know how much of what the computer does is handled by the operating system what is the operating system and things like that um, by building up um, through this idea of writing an operating system then we can really learn about all these other things they kind of all tie together um, so the idea is just to show you some very practical things like how we can start to write um, low level code looking at assembly um, machine code um, then building up eventually into C so here we go then so uh, well, my name's Nick by the way and um, yes yeah, so um, what do I do well I'm I basically I'm, I'll, I suppose I'm a computer scientist and um, a programmer um, recently I've been working in security so all of these things are very relevant to the work that I do um, right let's get started anyway so the computer let's um, if we think about what the computer is well we've all most of us use a computer now for the work that we do. We press a button on a computer and switch it on. We wait a few seconds and then we start moving our mouse around and you know logging in and, and browsing the web. But what actually happens? Um, you know, how, how does that how does that system get started and how you know how is it built up? Well, really, I mean, the hardware. The actual hardware inside the computer is very simple. The things it does, um, the actual theory of how it works, is rooted in um, like Alan Turing's work, I suppose. Like the idea that you can write, um, you can solve any problem by writing a like a computer program. And a computer program is something where um, you can define functions, and the functions can call other functions, and the functions can modify data, and the data that they modify can control how other functions are called and things like that so you can really by using this simple idea of calling fun functions having conditions you know if this do that else do this um, you can build up very complex systems but the hardware that supports that usually has a very small relatively instruction set and um, it can only do very basic things like add numbers together multiply numbers together um, there's a ten tendency now for the modern hardware to have more parallel processing so although it still does the simple instructions like adding things you know um, checking conditions doing logic then to get more speed out of the thing then it tends to you tend to get like more parallel pipeline of instructions I'll talk about this stuff later on but anyway the hardware is usually relatively very simple the way that we interface with it but it's the layers of software on top of it that give us all of the richness of using the computer um, and of course we couldn't do the things that we could do if we couldn't if the hardware couldn't perform as fast as it does especially when you look at gaming and stuff like that gaming is always pushing the um, like the performance boundaries of the machine um, okay so onto the computer well, if we want to understand how our computer works then um, I've taken the approach here that we we're going to start from looking at how it boots up and we're gonna if we can take control of it as soon as it boots up then we we suddenly enter into this very low level environment and um, that we're not used to when we're using high level languages where we have all these APIs of functions we can go call, call to do window you know draw windows and uh, write games all of that stuff at the lowest level and um, even before the operating system starts when we're booting and um, we have a very limited environment what we can do but it's very useful without all of that stuff getting in the way it's a very useful place for us to understand how to write assembly and how machine code works so we're going to do that so 
Um, well, firstly, how does this computer boot? So when I turn the computer on, it boots up. Um, well, it, I know that I can install Windows or Linux or you know whatever else on my computer and boot it into that operating system. But how does it actually start it? Um, the computer itself doesn't really, um, it, when it first boots up, it doesn't really know much about you know the hardware that's connected to it or anything like that. So, for example, when the computer boots without an operating system, it wouldn't be able to switch into some sort of 3D graphics um, context for playing games, for example, because the software required to drive that hardware is just not available to the computer. The operating system has to find and load all of that stuff. So, what does a computer do? Well, it needs to be able to load the operating system from the disk, um, so it must have some capability of reading data from a disk and um, this stuff is encapsulated in what's called BIOS and or, or some variant of BIOS but I'll just talk about BIOS so the idea of BIOS which means basic input output system is that um, the computer has some software um, written in a chip on the motherboard um, that can do some very low level initialization of the computer to get it into a state where it can do some basic input output enough so that it can read the disk, read an operating system and then start that bootstrap process of loading the operating system. Um, the other things it can do are it can you know it can render stuff to the screen. So when the computer boots we usually see it start in like a text mode, a simple text mode where we can see some console text. So that's also important that we can do that. Um, so that's what it is, basic input output. It's just a very a very basic form of input output on the computer. And without that um, that initial software in the chip, we wouldn't be able to start the operating system. So, um, we're going to look at writing a, a boot sector from scratch from using the hexadecimal. So, just writing machine code, um, which will really highlight how the computer works. Um, but basically, the boot process, how it works, is when you look at if you take the disk out of your um, laptop or whatever, and you look at the disk. Um, at a very low level what you'll see is that it's just um, the, it, the way we interface with that disk at a low level is that we just read sectors from it and a sector is a fixed size chunk of, of bytes um, that we read off at a time from the disk um, usually I mean they, they're slightly bigger now I suppose for performance reasons but we often have chunks of 512 bytes and that's a sector and these map onto the surface of the disk if it's like um, a hard drive um, if this is like a USB memory storage device then these will map onto some part of the memory um, but anyway so it, we, we read sectors from the disk and um, so BIOS is able to read some sectors from the disk and then it's got to boot them but the thing is that when you have disks in your machine some of those disks might have data on them and some of them might not have an operating system on so BIOS needs to know whether um, it can run the code on the disk or not. And um, the thing with a machine is that there's no real differentiation between code and data stored in memory. It's what makes the machine so powerful because we can mix code and data up. Um, you can even write code that can write itself by writing to data that then runs as code. So this is very powerful, but it does mean that um, BIOS needs some way to know um, whether the, a sector on our um, on our disk is bootable or not, so that it can run that code, and then that will load the operating system. So, um, what we have is um, a there's a magic number usually that goes at the end of the boot sector on the disk. So, and all the boot sector is is it's the very first sector on the disk drive, sector zero. So, BIOS can loop through all of the disk devices, if, if I've got a CD installed or I've got a hard disk or I've got a USB stick installed when I turn on the computer, BIOS can loop through them all, read the first sector off them, check if it's bootable by looking if it's got a magic number in it. Um, I'll, I'll show you the magic number soon. And then if it's got one, it will run that code. And once that code runs, that will do some more bootstrapping to load other code, um, usually using BIOS routines initially. And once that code is loaded, um, well, then it can start to boot the operating system. 
Um, I'll, I'll talk more. The, the, the computer starts in different stages too. So the other thing that's important is that um, when your computer boots, it will start in um, what's called 16-bit mode. And this is to be compatible with very old X, x86 processors. Because um, you might want to run an older operating system on your machine. And if your machine doesn't start in a state that knows how to execute that machine code, um, then it's not going to be compatible. So all modern processors, although they, you know, they, the architectures advanced up and the, you know, the, the assembly instructions, machine code instructions have been extended in places um, to better match requirements of software. They still all start off in this initial 16-bit mode, a very basic mode, emulating an older processor. And it's the the boot the boot code from the boot sector and then the the early operating system code that runs that is responsible for switching up into um, you know 32-bit protected mode or 64-bit mode. And I'll talk about that a bit later on in lectures. But let's get on to some examples anyway. So what we're going to do is we're going to write a boot sector. Um, well, first of all, we're going to be working in hexadecimal. So it's important to understand um, why we need hexadecimal, really. Um, often when you see especially if you're new to programming uh, and you see somebody writing numbers in hexadecimal you often think you know is there any need for that why has that person suddenly started writing hexadecimal code so you can write numbers in hexadecimal or decimal um, and they both mean the same thing but the real reason for using hexadecimal is that um, if you look at this diagram here it's much easier to convert between binary strings and hexadecimal than it is between binary and decimal. Um, the way internally the way the computer works is it's basically got on-off states that, which relate to digital signals um, and so we see binary numbers like this one. Okay. Um, sometimes we have structures inside memory that use bits. We, we switch bits on and off to represent different properties of those structures. So. Um, if we, the thing with binary is that it's very long-winded to write these numbers out, you know, to write a program in binary. Um, it would be very confusing. Um, to write it in decimal, it would be confusing to convert it between binary to understand how it's represented actually in the system. But hexadecimal is a nice medium. Um, because, um, because it's base 16 and binary is base 2, it's much easier for them to uh, to convert between them. So if I look at this binary um, number here, if I want to convert that to hexadecimal, then I can just treat it as chunks of four bits. If you look here, we separate them out. And with those four bits, um, it's much easier to convert those into actual, I suppose, decimal numbers within, you know, less than the number 16. So for example, here we see that it's got the it's not got the one bit set, so it's it's not got a one. It's got the um, the two bit set, so it's got a two. It's got the four bit set, and it's not got the eight bit set. So the number here is four plus two, so we get six. So we get um, six x decimal there, um, and the same for these. We can do that. It's so it's much easier can, to convert this into a decimal number, and just use that as a, a fragment of the final hexadecimal number than it is to um, remember all of these numbers. For example, to remember that this bit is like adding this number 32,768 um, to the final number to get the decimal. So basically it's much easier to switch between hexadecimal and binary and that's why it's useful to know. Um, and now what I'm going to do is go into a hex editor. Um, I'm going to write a boot sector. And with this boot sector, I'm just going to demonstrate that we can um, we can run it um, inside of um, a virtual machine. Um, now, if I can take if I can run my boot sector code inside a virtual machine, then I can run it on any physical machine as well. And then I'll talk about um, using emulators, which is a much more easy way to write boot sector code. Test it. So, what are we doing now? So, we're going to um, write the boot sector. So first of all, what I'm going to do is um, create 
make the boot sector fail. Okay, all I've done now is create an empty file. Um, it's, it's got no bytes in it. Um, if I just look at the size of it, um, okay, it's put. I think it's put one byte in it. So I've created that empty file. Um, and now if I open that in a, a hex editor, I'm using G hex here, but you could use whatever you prefer. Um, what I'm going to do now is write some hex decimal numbers into this um, this file, and then I'm going to write this directly as a I'm going to use this directly as a boot sector in a virtual machine to run this code that I write in here. Um, what I'm demonstrating here is that the computer all it understands is um, is numbers. Okay, and a program, as far as the computer is concerned, is just a sequence of numbers that it treats as um, opcodes, which are commands like jump or um, you know the comparing numbers, um, copying data, and um, things like that. It understands the opcodes, and then I can I can give like arguments to those opcodes, which are also encoded as numbers. The point here is that it's not, it's not, uh, this isn't the most intuitive way to write code for a computer, but it's going to help us understand it. And we're going to look at, once we've done this, we're going to look at how we can write things in assembly that compile down into um, machine code. And then we'll build on top of that and look at C. So let's start off. So um, what I'm going to do, first of all, is just um, write this boot sector. So in here I'm going to type some bytes. These are hexadecimal numbers. Okay. And now I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is because um, I told you the boot sector um, BIOS expects to read a boot sector that's five hundred and twelve bytes long. So what I've got to do is make sure that this file is five hundred and twelve bytes long. Um, in hexadecimal, I'm looking at this offset down here, which is telling me the current byte in the file that I'm editing. And if I get this to 200 in hexadecimal, then that will be 512 decimal. Okay, here we go. So what we've got there is 200. Um, actually, what we want one byte less because um, this is this byte here is the 512th byte. Right, okay, let's, let's look at this. So I've written some things in here, and what this represents here is um, a, an x86 um, machine code instruction to jump to itself, which translates to an endless jump. So it's gonna jump to its own address, and then it will it'll do the instruction again so it'll just keep jumping. The reason I've done this is because we don't want to write any um, well we don't want to write much code in hexadecimal in machine code um, but we do want to make sure that we can see that it's working and one way of making sure that it's working is to throw the computer into an endless loop so that it will just it will just run it will just hang there but it won't fail or anything like that. Um, okay so Let's carry on. So if you remember, well actually what, let me, um, no, I'll do this first. So if you remember, I said that BIOS, when it loads the, the boot sector from the disk, it needs some way of um, differentiating between um, a block on the disk that's just data and a block on a disk that's bootable. Um, so it looks at the end, the very end of the first sector on the disk for the magic number. And the magic number is just a, a well-known number that it expects to find there. If that number's not there, then this um, this sector won't be treated as a boot sector, and the code that I've written at the top won't boot. For now, I'll just put the magic number in. Um, but that the magic number looks like this. I just delete that. Okay, so that's the magic number. 
Um, oh, good. Right, so what have I done? I've just, wrote, I've just written a boot sector in uh, machine code. And I'm going to save that. The idea of this is it's supposed to be tedious. That's why it's taken ages. Um, so, save my boot sector. And now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run a bit of code to turn that boot sector into um, an ISO image. Um, an ISO image just it's like a it's an image file of a CD ROM, and we can use that to load it into a virtual machine. So how I can do that? Don't need to worry too much about what I'm doing here, but basically I'm just um, turning that boot sector into an ISO image. Okay, so now what I've got is I've created this file called um, myos.iso and um, this is just for now it's just got my boot section in it that just has that endless loop. So what I should be able to do now is to load this um, as though it was um, an operating system installation disk into my virtual machine and it should hang there because of my jump instruction that I wrote to the machine code. So let's do that. So I'm, I'm in VirtualBox now, which is a, an open source free um, VM virtual machine system. Um, now, and what I could do, that ISO file that I created, I could take that, write it to a CD-ROM and um, stick it in my computer and reboot it and boot it on my real computer. But it's, it's very convenient now to use virtual machines to test things like that and it works in the same way. So, I'm going to create a new virtual machine, and I'll call it Test VM. It doesn't matter what operating system it is, because I'm, I'm using my own little operating system anyway. Um, okay, so I'll... Yeah, I'm just creating a standard VM here. Okay, and now I'm going to start my VM. Um, we'll just ignore that. What you'll see is that my virtual machine has no operating system, so it's pretty much this is the equivalent of um, when somebody's I bought a new computer that's not got an operating system, and I've just switched it on, and it's telling me there's nothing to boot. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just close this down, and I'm going to in insert that that ISO file that I created with my boot sector code on as though it was a CD-ROM into the virtual machine. So if I go to, um, where I to go? Um, second, of a machine, I want to find a, a virtual disk. Oh, here it is. So my OS, which I just created, and I'm going to open it. And um, OK. So now, um, inside my virtual drive on this virtual machine, I've got my IS ISO file that I created. And now I'm going to power the virtual machine on. And what's happened? Look. So, well, we've got a blank page, but this is good. OK, because um, what he's doing is, it's not said there's no bootable um, disk on the machine. It's picked up my boot sector that I wrote, and it's um, it's booted it, and it's gone into an endless loop. So this is probably one of the fastest loops I can run on this computer, or if I installed it on a physical computer, it would be the fastest loop I could make, because it's running, there's no operating system, it is the operating system, it's running at the, the lowest level, it's just running a loop. Um, if I wanted to heat up my office, um, I could probably do something like this, and it would just—it was just looping around. So the CPU is just spinning around and around as fast as it can. Um, we're going to look later on how we can write strings to the screen and stuff, and we're going to build that up. Um, but that's that's good. Now let's just um, just to play around with that idea some more. If I take my um, if I edit that boot sector again. And what I'm going to do is 
this magic number at the end I'm going to change it slightly so instead of having um, that thing I'm going to change it to 5F. So it's now not got the magic number so let's save that. Um, okay now I'm going to just make that boot sector again. Um, yeah. Let me just recreate that. Okay, so I've created that boot sector again, and now if I power run my VM. Okay, so it's still using the. Um, let me just change that. It's still. I need to just remove this. So, what I'm doing now is. Um, in fact, what I'll do, I'll demonstrate this in. I'll, I'll just explain how we can use emulation to do this stuff. So, I was, I was using a virtual machine there very useful. Often a virtual machine is, is good for when you're actually running a real operating system. Um, but when you're writing this kind of low-level code, an emulator is often more suitable because you can quickly run the emulator. Um, you can, it's, an emulator allows very powerful debugging of very low-level code. And just to explain the difference between a virtual machine, so a virtualization and emulation, is that with virtualization, the, the software such as VMware or VirtualBox tries to um, run as much code natively on the, 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 the host processor from the guest operating system as possible. Um, although in some cases it can't do that because like when you switch into the operating system or you, you call hardware um, CPU instructions, you have to emulate those. So a virtual, virtual machine tries to um, optimized for like practical usage so using the CPU directly whereas with emulation the software actually pretends to be the CPU and all the instructions run um, within the emulated environment so when it's calling a CPU instruction and um, it's actually just simulated like in some C code or something so if I call uh, an assembly instruction to move something into a register and then add a value to it that will translate to maybe some C code in the emulator that um, that stores that simulates the register as a variable and when it adds one register to another one it just uses an add um, a high level add function so um, the thing with emulation is you can emulate different computer architectures on, on your machine so you could emulate um, different you know, like an ARM processor or a RISC processor on a um, like an x86 machine. So let me just um, run my boot sector again. So what I'm going to do now is run my boot sector that I just wrote in a thing called QMU which is a it's quite a nice emulation. So this, this runs just like a, an actual PC. So I'm passing it my boot sector that I created. And we'll see what happens. Okay. So here what it's doing is um, it's trying to boot from the well, I passed it the drive to boot from, which was just my boot sector. And it's saying it can't boot from it, it's saying no bootable device. It's gonna retry, and it's just trying things like um, Oh, it's looking um, for DHCP, it's trying to do like a network boot, it's looking for um, a host on the network that, that it can boot from. But there's nothing there, so it can't boot. So if I kill this process, and then in my hex editor, if I put this back to the magic number, the magic number now to the end of my boot sector 
and I'm going to try that again and see if it boots. So it's saying it's booting. Okay, this is similar to VMware, but this is using QMU now and it's basically gone into that loop again, so it's working. So what that showed was that if I don't have the magic number in my boot sector, so the first sector on the disk that I give to the virtual machine or the emulator machine, then it doesn't try to boot the code, it doesn't run. So what we've got now is, um, we've written a very low level um, piece of code for the machine. In fact, it runs directly. There's no there's no operating system running when we run this code. Um, the code that we run is the equivalent of the operating system or the operating system bootloader. Um, what we're going to do um, in the next lecture after this is look at how we can um, write start writing stuff in assembly, and we're going to write some boot sector code in assembly and start to build up then um, until we can look at how we would start to write some bootstrapping code to load C and all of that stuff. So um, so there's our boot sector, so just to look at that again if I um, I look at my boot sector, so we just wrote those um, these values into here which represented it, the machine card instructions for a jump. Like I said, the computer just understands numbers. Um, it, when we write in high level languages like C or even assembly, and we use things like um, if and you know um, function, you know call the function, stuff like that, plus equals, um, whatever. The computer doesn't understand that stuff. That's just for us so that we can easily um, differentiate between instructions and usually the compiler or the assembly will then translate those things that we understand into low level machine code instructions and if you take any compiled program um, you can always edit it in a, in a hex editor and you can look at the assembly instructions inside it so this was our jump here um, and at the end we had our magic number all the way down the bottom ok I've gone way past it there magic number. There it is, the BIOS magic number. Um, just ignore these other bytes at the end here. I had to extend this um, beyond 512 bytes when I was creating that ISO image. That's why it's these other numbers. But the boot sector is from here all the way up to here. So we created a boot sector. Now just before we end this, um, what I'm going to do is, which is quite interesting, is to look at a real life boot sector so um, on my machine when I switch my machine on it boots up and I've got this machine configured to run um, it, it either can boot into Windows 7 um, which I use occasionally and um, Linux and um, so what I'm going to do is look at the boot sector on my disk that um, starts all of that off to see how that compares with the boot sector that we have. so without this boot sector my computer wouldn't start. If I deleted this boot sector, I'd have to um, put it back somehow, otherwise I wouldn't be able to use my machine. Let's see what's inside it. So, uh, well, first of all, I need to... Let's just clean that. I'm just going to run this command, uh, which it uses this DD Linux command, which is uh, basically just for copying bytes from one file or device to another and what I'm doing here is copying this device here, dev SDA, is my main hard drive in my machine and I'm saying use this as the input and as the output just write to a normal file and I'm saying copy sectors of size 512 bytes long and copy one of them so basically this command is just saying copy the, the very first sector from my hard disk into a file and then I can um, then I'm going to look at that in the hex editor. So let's do that. So I've copied it. Um, now if I run G hex on this, so I'm, I'm now looking at my real boot sector from my machine. There we go. Look at that. So well, we've got lots of stuff in here. Now from from the stuff I uh, I'd showed you before, we know now that much of this stuff at the start will be. Um, um, machine code opcodes and their arguments to do jumps and stuff like this um, and but I don't know from looking at this without disassembling it which 
we can do easily enough if we want to. Without disassembling this, it's harder for me to differentiate between what this is code and what is data. Now, if you look on this right-hand side, you'll see that there are some recognizable text, text in there. So these are definitely data and not code. Um, but anyway, it doesn't really matter. The point is that within this boot sector on my disk, it's got a bit of code um, that does something, and it's got some data in there too. Now, this stuff here, so it's mentioned in Grub. So Grub is a bootloader, um, and it's the bootloader that I use to boot my machine. So when I set up this machine, I used Grub, which is this software, um, to create a bootloader to allow me to boot between Windows and Linux. And this first sector can't contain the whole of that bootloader because Grub is much more complex than that. But what it can do is have a bit of code that, that can do enough to load some more code from the disk. Because um, remember, BIOS only loads the first sector, whereas Grub um, spans a few, um, probably kilobytes, I think. So it'll load some more sectors from the disk. Um, and then with those, it'll have some more advanced code that knows how to load Windows or Linux. Um, well, it, if we look at the end of this, boot sector we see our magic number there 55AA. If I took that man magic number out um, and then rebooted my machine I wouldn't be able to boot it up, I'd have to boot up from some other, like some CD or something and then edit my boot sector and put that magic number back in to make it work. And um, Also in the boot sector when you have partition drives, the end of the boot sector, probably somewhere around here although I can't be sure, but it'll be somewhere towards the end of the boot sector um, it will have information about the partitions um, to say that um, a disk drive that's so large has been split up into separate partitions. Usually you can have four partitions listed in there and if you need more partitions then it has to reference another sector that's got more stuff in but we don't need to worry about that now. But basically the boot sector has got some code in it for, for initia initiating the boot after BIOS loads the boot sector and it's got some data in there. Use it for partitions or for something else and the magic numbers at the end. So that's everything really. Um, after, in the next lecture, we can look at um, writing some boot sector code in um, assembly. And, um, and it's a really nice way of getting more familiar with the low level side of computing. Now, not because we want to spend all of our time writing assembly, because we don't. The problem with writing in assembly is that, um, okay, you can optimize things, but you can only optimize them for a particular process processor. So if I then want to run my assembly code or my program that I wrote on another architecture, um, you know, like a, an arm, like a tablet, some, you know, or a phone or something like that, I have to rewrite it in the assembly for that particular architecture. Um, but by understanding assembly and machine code, how the computer works, how it boots, we can really have a better understanding of how an operating system works and, um, and also understand how our high level um, code that we write works underneath so that if we do need to optimize things or you know whatever then it's useful. And this is particularly interesting when you come to writing in C and if you if you if you start writing in C f with a background of writing in Java or you know some scripting language like Python or something like this then you always find it difficult to grasp the pointers and that side of memory referencing because it feels strange to talk about memory addresses in a high level language when before you, before that you didn't need to worry about it in Java and things. And um, whereas if you if you come at C from a low level from assembly, then um, the addressing and the pointers make a lot more sense. So we're going to try and look at it that way. So um, we'll leave that for later on anyway. But thank you for um, listening, and um, and I'll be back with another lecture soon. Thank you.